Hello, my name is Shaista Zahiruddin. I am a registered dietitian and today I want to talk to you about diabetes, especially how to prevent diabetes. I am a South Asian and like any South Asian, I know at least one or more person personally who has diabetes, especially someone in my family. And this comes really surprising to me because South Asia is a place where there are so many spices and so many healthy foods that are eaten every day. Spices are known as antioxidants. They help prevent diseases. These include spices like haldi, cinnamon, and then there are foods like karela, okra or bhindi or ladyfinger and isovgol which is psyllium husks. So there's so many healthy foods that are known to help manage blood sugar levels. Then why is it that every other South Asian person has diabetes? The short answer to that is diabetes is a complex condition that means that many different factors are coming together to cause diabetes. That is why no one or two foods can actually help treat or cure diabetes. There needs to be a complex variety of things because there are complex different conditions that are causing it. So let me just give you a quick review of how our body works and what might be causing diabetes. In a healthy person who is eating an adequate and healthy diet, almost all food has some kind of carbohydrate in it. Now, when we eat, this goes and gets digested. The broken sugar, which is now called glucose, enters our blood. Our red blood cells pick up these sugars by a compound called hemoglobin A1C. You must have heard the word A1C before. So this binds to the sugar and now the sugar is going to be taken up to different parts of our body. When there is glucose in our blood after we eat, a signal is sent to our brain to tell us that we have a lot of sugar. So the brain sends a signal to an organ called the pancreas which releases insulin. One of the role of insulin is to take up sugar and put it into the cell. It has many other functions, but this is the most important function that insulin has. So when insulin comes in, it goes and binds to something called an insulin receptor, which is part of our cell. This insulin then acts like a key to open up the cell and this triggers a series of reactions inside our cell, which then helps to open up a tunnel to allow sugar to enter the cell. But for somebody who has been diagnosed with borderline diabetes or prediabetes, or maybe the other word you might have heard is insulin resistance, something else is happening inside the body. I'm going to be talking about type 2 diabetes. There are two types of diabetes. 80% of people who have diabetes have type 2. Type 1 is a genetic problem where our body cannot make insulin and that's where insulin is needed. And that is a rare form of diabetes. It is only present in about 20% of people who have diabetes. So I'm actually going to talk to you about type 2 diabetes, which is where we have some control our lifestyle and our food habits have a big impact on creating it. In type 2 diabetes, there is enough insulin, at least in the beginning. Everything is working as it should. So the insulin comes in and goes and tries to bind to an insulin receptor. But unfortunately, this process doesn't work so well. There is something called insulin resistance. So the insulin does come in, but it's not able to open up the lock and there is no tunnel created for blood glucose. So the glucose stays in the blood and it does not get into the cells. Now when sugar 
goes into a cell, it gives you energy. And this energy is used for all body functions to move, to talk, to listen, to walk, to open our eyes, to shut our eyes. All of this requires energy. And when not enough sugar is getting into our cells, we have less energy. So that means a lot of people who are pre-diabetic or even diabetic feel tired very often. And this is one of the reasons why. So in someone who is borderline diabetic, not all of their cells are insulin resistant, but it is starting. So pre-diabetes is defined as impaired fasting glucose. So when you take your blood sugars early in the morning when you haven't eaten anything and if your blood sugars are high between 6.1 to 6.9 millimoles per liter, that is when prediabetes is diagnosed. The other definition of prediabetes is impaired glucose tolerance. So that means your body is not able to take up the glucose after you eat and put them in your cells. So it is not still diabetes. So your blood sugars, say two hours after you eat, is if it's between 7.8 to 11, or after 75 grams of glucose tolerance test, that means that you are pre-diabetic. And also the A1C, our blood cells get recycled every three months. Since I told you before, A1C binds to glucose and transports it around our body. So looking at the A1C gives us a good idea of how much sugar was attached to our red blood cells in the last three months. If your A1C is between 6 to 6.4, that means you have prediabetes. That means that you're at that borderline stage where you are about to develop diabetes. And if it's not treated at this point, there is a good chance that you will develop diabetes in the next 5 to 20 years. This is why it is very important to start prevention as soon as possible. If you can start preventing it since childhood, that would be ideal. Prevention is always better than cure. Once you have crossed the stage of these numbers, it cannot be turned back. So what is insulin resistance? Insulin resistance is when the cell just decides that it does not want the insulin. Why does this happen? Now, 50% of this is genetics. That's why people who have a family history of diabetes are more likely to get diabetes. That's because we have genes that make our cells resistant, unfortunately. But that is only 50% of the cause. We still have 50% which comes from lifestyle, which is modifiable so we can change that so we can maybe can change 50 percent of our destiny to get diabetes but we still have a 50 percent chance of changing it now about 25 to 35 percent of insulin resistance is because of something called central obesity so that means being overweight but more so having weight or fat near the belly area now we have two types of fat well, the type of fat that is under our skin that is right under our skin like for example our legs our thighs our arms our face we all have a little bit of fat right under our skin it creates insulation so helps protect us from heat and cold all of that and that is important and that's not the bad kind of fat that's not the fat we are talking about there is Another type of fat called visceral fat. This is the fat that is something you can't really see. It is near or around our essential organs such as the liver and our intestines and our kidneys. It is in that area near the belly. So it's not exactly under our skin, but it's further down near and within our organs. When there's too much of that and it grows, you'll start to see it and you'll see your stomach growing that is a sign that your visceral fat is increasing and this is the one that's going to start causing a lot of problems so about 15 to 25 percent of insulin resistance is caused by sedentary lifestyle it means sitting too much if you're sitting more than two hours straight without moving this will lead to insulin resistance and this will create diabetes. When insulin resistance is not treated early, there is 
more and more visceral fat in or near our organs. When there's a lot of sugar in our blood, which is not going inside our cells, this triggers more insulin to be produced. Now, over time, the pancreas that is producing all this insulin on demand, it is constantly producing insulin because our body is constantly high in sugar. It's always asking for more insulin. This makes our pancreas and the cells that produce insulin get tired and over time they start dying. They start killing themselves. And this is when we have diabetes. So in this series of videos, I will be discussing how to treat the underlying causes of diabetes, preventing the fat buildup or the visceral fat buildup near or around your organs by reducing fat in your diet, by telling you the kinds of fats that are good for you and the type that are not, and how to replace the good fats with the bad fats while still keeping the quantity low. We will be talking ab about the advantages of losing even a 5% of weight. There is a large body of evidence that supports that if you lose even 5% of your initial body weight, you can significantly reduce the transition from prediabetes to diabetes by 60%. So you can actually reverse becoming diabetic just by losing 5% of your body weight. And then I'll give you an exercise prescription that will help you build to the level of activity that is prescribed, which is 150 minutes of moderate intense activity for five days a week, every week. And this is a lifestyle that you need to stick to for as long as you live to be able to prevent and manage diabetes. So this is not for somebody who wants a quick fix or who is looking for just one thing that you can do to cure your diabetes. That's not possible. It's not even realistic. We will also be discussing some of the symptoms and how to treat some of the symptoms of diabetes, which include controlling blood sugar response and the insulin response. Now, just so you know, when there's too much insulin in our blood, there is a possibility of the insulin seeping out onto our skin. This is when a lot of people have things like skin tags or even dark patchy skin in or near their skin folds, especially behind their necks or under their arms or between their legs or between any skin fold. That is called acanthosis nigricans. And this is one of the symptoms of having high insulin in our body. Keep a look out for that as well. And then we'll talk about the quantity and quality of the carbohydrates to make sure the blood sugar is controlled in a fashion that does not trigger insulin resistance. We will talk about when and where and what to eat. And we will also talk about the kinds of foods that you can eat to reduce inflammation. That means that we make our body strong enough to improve its own immune system and fight its own battles. To do that, we'll be talking about whole foods and I will be trying to focus more on the South Asian population using the South Asian lifestyle and cuisines. So in a nutshell, this series is for somebody who has recently been diagnosed with either pre-diabetes or even if you have diabetes or someone who's, who has polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is also for somebody who is worried about the risk of developing diabetes or someone who has a person in their family who has diabetes and worried that you might develop it. This is also for somebody who wants to improve their overall diet and lifestyle so that they can prevent diabetes in the long term. The advice I'll give you can be followed by someone who is not on diabetic medication and this is also for someone who is on diabetic medication. This is not for someone who is not willing to incorporate healthy, balanced nutrition in their life, someone who is not ready to include activity or exercise 
into their lifestyle because healthy living is 70% healthy foods and 30% exercise and they complete each other. If you don't do one, you won't be able to see the result that you're trying to get. And this is not for somebody who's looking for a single pill or a single food or ingredient to reverse their diabetes or reverse their symptoms. And this is not for somebody who is not willing to listen to their doctor or their healthcare provider or their dietitian. Also a quick disclaimer, although I am a registered dietitian and everything I will tell you will be based on the most current evidence and the most practical step, but this is for the general population. If you have other conditions along with your diabetes or your pre-diabetes, then it is better for you to consult your own dietitian so that you get the best advice for you. And I hope you will find this series helpful. Please stay tuned and I will come next Friday with another video on helping you prevent diabetes. Thank you and see you next Friday.